uh, or studies that have found MS-like symptoms in animals that are infected with filarial worms. If we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha, and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And these topics are really, really important, or talking about these filarial worms is really, really important, especially if we suffer with not just MS, but other neurological diseases. Why? Number one, because Dr. Alan McDonald, who is a very well-respected pathologist in the United States, found small roundworms, filarial worms, in the spinal fluid and the brain, but especially the spinal fluid, of every single patient that he tested that died, uh, that had MS. Number two, one of my students who had MS and she was a med student, she would test her blood and she would test another person's blood who had MS. And she said it was very easy to find these filarial worms in the blood. Number three, animal studies show these MS-like symptoms in animals that are infected with these filarial roundworms in their central nervous system also. And number four, in the Live Disease Free Academy, we've helped hundreds of students in their recovery from MS and other neurological diseases. And we're finding that they're testing really well for and having tremendous symptom improvement when they are using um, these anti, the parasite drugs. Okay, I don't see that. Let me just see. I know that there is a time lag. I'm just going to check with somebody, Danielle, to make sure, oh, just a sec here, what's going on, to make sure that it is working, because I'm not sure that it's working here. Okay, yes, there we go, you're there, awesome. I couldn't tell if you guys were there. I just had to pull up a little window. So those, those are the main reasons why we are studying this. We are finding that treating these filarial worms are really, really important in recovery. We're having huge improvements, especially in the symptoms that those animals have when they have the worms in their spinal fluid. So we're doing a several part series, I am, about these filarial worms. Part the first part, and make sure if you haven't watched them, you can go back and watch them, but the first part was really looking at filarial worms filarial worms and their role in neurological diseases. The second part was what are filarial worms? So in the first part, we talked a little bit about the relevance about Dr. Alan McDonald's findings. The second part, we looked more at are, how prevalent are these filarial worm infections? Where do we find them in the world? What is their life cycle like? When we study these kind of things, it really helps us to understand even little things like how do we test for them better, learning that they are nocturnal. And if we want to measure them in our blood, we'll find them a lot easier at night if we test the blood after midnight. So really understanding the enemy or one of the enemies, one of the infections, the parasites that are causing neurological disease is really important. Today, we're going to look at some studies that really help us to see, and it's really sad that this has not been followed up for so many years. And that's what I really hope will encourage as we discuss this. But why they've seen these worms in the central nervous system of many types of animals, domestic animals especially, and they have very similar symptoms to ones that we suffer with when we have multiple sclerosis and other neurological diseases. And as you'll see, this one study, these researchers, and this was in the 1950s, they're saying, like, we really need to study in humans because it could easily be that these worms are causing these symptoms in humans also. Nobody picked up that ball. Nobody took on that challenge until Dr. Alan McDonald in, I think, 2014 or 2016, where he found many, many filarial worms in this, especially in the spinal fluid of people that suffer with MS. So that's what we're going to talk about is the animal studies today. We're just going to cover a couple of them, but there is so much. If you love research, maybe you have a science degree, maybe you're a practitioner, maybe you're a researcher, then you may want to continue with a study on your own. But if we look at this one particular study that was done in 1953, and the title of the study is called, it's really awesome, it's really old though, Cerebrospinal Nematidiasis Focal 
encephalomyelomalacia of animals caused by nematodes. And they were looking specifically at the nematode called, or the worm, filarial worm called Ceteria digitata, a disease which can occur in man. So that's all the title for this article. You can look that up if you like after. This was done in 1953. And this is one of the studies that Dr. Alan McDonald talked about as he was doing his lecture about the findings of his findings of the filarial worms in the spinal fluid of all those people that had died that had MS. So these were people that it was documented for sure they had an MS, multiple sclerosis, the, the brains and spinal fluid, et cetera, the, the, the remains of the central nervous system came from a brain bank. So they would have been definitely from people that died of MS. And he found many, many worms in the spinal fluid. So these authors of this study that was done in 1953, they were saying how it's really important to like look at humans, not just animals, because very often in history, when they've studied diseases in animals, they have found that 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 has helped them to understand diseases in humans. So for example, one example would be the sleeping sickness in humans. So probably about 20 years before they discovered sleeping, what sleeping, what caused sleeping sickness in humans, they found that there was a protozoa, a small single cell parasite that caused sleeping sickness in animals. And then years later, they discovered that that is the issue in humans also. So there are ne a number of cases where animal studies have really helped them to understand the causes of diseases in humans later on. So another thing that's really relevant, what they said back in the day, a long time ago, 1953, is there is evidence that the role of nematodes, which are roundworms, and they're small, they're very small. And we talked about that last week. So go, if you want to learn more about the worms, what, how big they are, et cetera, go back and watch that later. What are filarial worms? But they shared, there is evidence that the role of nematodes in the production of neurological disorders in animals may be a global problem. So I want you to remember that as we talk, because sometimes there are certain countries that might pick up the research more. So maybe Korea and Japan and the Far East and Middle East, etc., India. But that doesn't mean that those worms are not present here. That just means that they may have higher incident. Maybe they weren't treating. Because I know that in, let's say, in Canada, we have some really big feedlots. And they regularly treat the animals with ivermectin and different um, parasite drugs. So this is something that, but we, we they don't treat us. That's the big problem. So we have to remember that they, through all their research, they believe that this is a global problem in animals. So, and... The filarial worms in the central nervous system of domestic animals was discovered over 80 years ago. So over 80 years ago, they found these little tiny worms in the spinal fluid in the central nervous system of domestic animals. So that would be things like goats and sheep and horses, cattle, also dogs and cats, but probably more of the livestock back at that time. And they called it lumbar paralysis. The condition was clinically described well over 150 years ago. So 80 years ago, they knew about these worms in the spinal fluid, but 150 years ago, they were already talking about this lumbar paralysis. They didn't know what caused it, but they just knew that certain animals would get it. So this has been a long time. And they found that animals really don't ever get huge indications when it starts, like they don't get a big fever, nothing traumatic. Another interesting thing is that the nerve lesions, so lesions similar to what we would have when we have our MRI and we're dealing with neurological diseases, especially MS. So the nerve lesions that these worms produce in the central nervous system are the same, whether it's like sheep, goats, horses, or different animals. And also, if these animals are from different countries, so the, the lesions are similar across different types of animals and in different countries. They do find that the number of lesions and the location of the lesions in the central nervous system does vary. And let's see here. <clears throat> the symptoms, this is what you'll find really interesting. 
So the symptoms, the clinical symptoms of animals that are infected with these nematodes in their central nervous system, they have motor weakness. So they have muscle weakness. They have ataxia, lack of coordination, kind of like swaying drunk and or slurred speech, stumbling, falling, paralysis, numbness, fatigue, and also spastic gait. These are all exactly the same symptoms that we have in multiple sclerosis, but also other conditions will have many overlap conditions and balance issues. So even with PLS and ALS, many of these different conditions have overlapping symptoms that would include these symptoms. They used special stains to see if there were any other bacteria, fungus, or other small parasites present. And of course, they didn't, they didn't test for all parasites, but they didn't really pick up any others. So we do know that there are other microbes, par infections that are involved. But at that time, when they did this in 1952, 1953, they were not able to detect any other problems, just the worms. So these researchers ask, we wonder, okay, I wanted to just backtrack for a minute. So I've shared in the previous, uh, like what filarial worms are, and we talked about their life cycle and how there are certain species or kinds, so they would be cousins. So they're all similar worms, but they're just a little different. They like to live in different parts of the body, etc. So some of the researchers think that, well, for example, Ceteria digitata, it the main host would be cattle and mosquitoes. But then sometimes it'll get into sheep and horses and humans, etc. Possibly, because we don't know all the species of what's infecting the humans. Dr. Alan McDonald has continued on with that research. He, I haven't had any update on that. But when these uh, parasites are in the central nervous system, sorry, let me backtrack. So when these worms are going through their normal life cycle, researchers will say, well, they, because maybe we get infected with them and we're not their primary host, then they kind of get lost and they find their way into our central nervous system or our eyes. And these re researchers say that because there are so many animals that have been infected with these filarial worms in their central nervous system, besides cattle, that they wonder why there wouldn't be a direct pathway that where these filarial worms would just directly go to the central nervous system and not accidentally go there, but that they just go there. Uh, so for example, they shared one other worm that infects fish. It's well, well known that it will travel through connective tissue and through muscle right into the spinal uh, vertebra and into the joints right into the central nervous system that way. So not necessarily just through the blood and crossing the blood brain barrier that way, but they actually move through tissue, connective tissue and muscle, which is disgusting. <laughs> so Everything that they researched here, they really felt that their observations really strengthened their conviction that it was so important to continue to study these worms, not just in animals, but also in humans. And they're the ones that said, you know, this really needs to be further studied in humans because this could be a big cause of disease in humans. And nobody has ever picked up this researcher or continued on with it until Dr. Alan McDonald did in 2014, 15 or 16, somewhere in there. I know his le lecture is 2016, but I think he was already mm -hmm. studying it in 2014. So this is really huge. And summary, just a little things that I picked up from that study, the summary, and you guys can read that this, if you like research, you can read it after. But the neural paralysis condition in sheep, goats, and horses. So they were studying a lot of countries like, uh, as I mentioned, Japan, Korea, and India, and the Middle East, the Far East. And so they find that it's seasonal. And so I'm just starting to research, you know, is MS like the number of attacks or maybe when people get really sick or maybe have more exacerbations is there a seasonal link with this? And apparently there is. Not to say it's lining up with this, but we'll look more into that. And I know that's been connected with vitamin D, which may or may not be the case. We know that when our vitamin D levels are lower, 
we're more susceptible to viruses and other infections. Our immune system is just not as strong. And they found that lesions formed. Uh, oh, that's what I wanted to share too, is that it's not just these worms that they were concerned about, but they were talking about how these worms also infect us. They were talking about viruses, but now we know Lyme disease also and other bacteria, I'm sure. So it's not just the worms that are the problem, but it's also what's living inside of them that is going to infect us, which is awful. And they shared that the damage that they found in the central nervous system of these am animals was more like trauma versus from a wandering worm. So that's what the, the damage looked like. And from the flarial worm, did, uh, this was from Ceteria digitata. So that's the worm that they were studying. And the main host, as I mentioned, is cattle and mosquitoes. But the unintentional hosts would be things like sheep and goats and horses and possibly humans, as Dr. Alan McDonald believes. All right, and then I wanted to share also a few other stories. I'm not going to go into a lot of other research, but I'm going to put a bunch of research. I know that I did a video quite a while ago where there were these, I'm sure there, was, there were these people that were working, uh, I don't know, the researchers working with animals infected and they developed neurological symptoms and or MS. I'm going to look back and find that. It just kind of tweaked. I think I did that a year or two ago, but I'll pull that in maybe for next week. We're going to talk about testing next week, how to test for these filarial worms. But other studies are finding, for example, a 1979 study of cerebral spinal nematodiasis nematodiasis caused by a specific roundworm in goats, this is in Texas, clinical signs of this, of the worms in the central nervous system in goats, they had lack of fear. So normally animals will be a little bit scared. And so they were lack of fear, terrible fatigue, paralysis in the lower half of their body, lack of coordination, general weakness, paralysis, drooping ears, and head usually at an angle, and spastic gait. So spasticity, you know, that cramping that we get, the drop foot, that's all part of what they see in animals. And so this is also in buffalo and in camels, in goats. And then I found, just before I jumped on the, this uh, event with you guys, I found that there's also a roundworm, and I should backtrack, a lot of times it's the larva. So it's not the full worm that's getting into the central nervous system. It's usually the larva that is getting into the central nervous system. But with Dr. Alan McDonald, he found full worms, filarial worms in the spinal fluid of MS patients. So another study found these immature forms of roundworms from raccoons that infected cats and dogs and made their way into their central nervous system and had all of these similar symptoms. So if there are different types of roundworms getting into the central nervous system of all these different animals, whether it's horses or cattle, cats or dogs, buffalo, goats, sheep, and they're all having similar symptoms to those of us that are dealing with neurological diseases, that is that is just so strong evidence that 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 is also but we also know that they are in our central nervous system because Al Dr. Alan McDonald found them. So it really helps us to understand the connection and it's it's a really big deal. So I hope you guys help me get the word out. I hope you share this with different groups, share it with your practitioners. I want this to be tested more, researched more, because I really believe that this is a very big part of recovering from chronic disease, especially neurological diseases. So I'm going to go to a few questions here that you guys might have to see if there was any. Oh, another thing that I just wanted to share too is that when they test these animals that have these filarial worms in their central nervous system, and they have all these horrible neurological diseases, very often they will test other things in them, like their blood work, and they'll find that their bodily functions are perfect or really good. And we see that with people that have MS also and other chronic diseases, very often they will have the most beautiful blood work and they were athletic before, maybe they were soccer players, dancers, etc. 
And then all of a sudden they started to lose their mobility and they started to get all these awful symptoms of balance issues and spasms and terrible fatigue and blindness. So we're talking right now about the worms getting into the central nervous system, but when these worms get into the eyes of the animals, I didn't even talk about that today, but they cause blindness just as they would in multiple sclerosis. So going on to your questions. Hi, Robin. Hi, Jolie. I'm going to go up to the top here. Hi, Sean. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Maureen. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't pull up the field at the start. That's why I didn't see you guys. Marianne, hello. Colleen, your neurologist showed you, um, my neurologist showed me big worms and the worst part where they are affecting me and I took and took my legs away. Your neurologist showed you um, maybe you can explain what you mean by that. I'm not sure. Neurologists usually don't understand about the worms, but but maybe you can explain more. I'm sorry, I'm missing something there. Hi, Rick. Hi, Colleen. Hi, Susie. Yes, it is so interesting. It is, it's not just interesting, it's super exciting. As I mentioned, if you just joined, maybe you missed the first part, but the reason that this is so relevant is number one, Dr. Alan McDonald, a very well-respected pathologist, has found filarial worms in the spinal fluid of every MS patient that he studied, many of them. I've done videos on that. If you want to look at um, MS as an infectious disease, I've got a playlist on YouTube, Live Disease Free. Watch it there. Number two, we can find these worms in the blood of MS patients quite easily. That's been demonstrated. I've got slides on it. Number three, we see the animal studies, how when these worms are in the animal studies, they have consistent symptoms with us. And number four, the students that work with me in the Live Disease Free Academy, they build a game plan to treat these worms. They're having tremendous improvements recovery using parasite drugs that would treat these filarial worms, which is really exciting. You have a cat, you can't stay without her. Cats are awesome, dogs are awesome, but just be aware, Jolie, and this is for anyone who has pets, don't let them sleep in your bed. They pass parasites on to you. There's something called toxoplasmosis that the cats can pass on to you, and they can cause a lot of neurological symptoms, uh, so you have to be really careful. And just be really careful if you're cleaning the litter, etc. Hi, Leah. You're very welcome. Hi, Robin. See if there's any other questions here. Okay. Yes, I really hope we get. So Mary Beth, you just have to help me. So you guys are the wellness champions. You have to help get this word out. Absolutely. Can nematodes in the MS spinal cord completely go away? Yes, they can. We've had students that have had their lesions heal over but it takes several cycles. It depends how sick we are. If we have been, just been diagnosed with MS or another neurological disease, maybe recently, maybe not even a diagnosis or maybe within a year or two, and we're still highly functioning, it's easier to treat the nematodes then. If we've had the MS for 30 years and we have a lot of disability, we can still recover. We can still have a ton of recovery, more than we ever thought possible, but we have to understand it takes several cycles because the drugs we're using, they're helpful. We have to use different strategies. I've shared, if you want to learn more about the Live Disease Free Academy, the steps we take to recover, you'll see a video in uh, Live Disease Free YouTube page. You can subscribe there. You can uh, hit the notification bell so you'll know when I go live each time. But you'll see the steps we take. And just popping a pill like a parasite drug is just not enough probably because of the dose and also the fact that they're limited in crossing the blood-brain barrier, but they're still more helpful than the, the herbs. But we usually use parasite drugs, herbs, and oxidizing agents. Yes, Robin. Have you had an MRI and he showed you where the worms are affecting you. So maybe, Colleen, I'd love for you to email me and maybe it's, if he said, if he agrees with you, I'd really like to correspond with this neurologist. Uh, it's usually 
they're usually not open to thinking about parasites being in the central nervous system. Maybe you believe that that is the case. But if he is, I would really like to connect with him. We have a practitioner members area and we are sharing everything with practitioners because we want the word to get out. So Clee, you were diagnosed with a flarial infestation. That is really interesting. Um, that is not common. But the doctor, so I'm not sure how, it would be interesting if you would let me know how they made that diagnosis. And the doctor cannot find an infectious disease doctor willing to help you and your husband. You are farmers in Texas. See, it is in, it is in developed countries, absolutely. And I'm sure like I grew up in Southern Alberta in a rural community. And I, I think about this because in, with multiple sclerosis, Canada has a very high incidence, especially in the rural areas. So in the rural areas, we have a lot of agricultural animals, right? And in Alberta, we are definitely treating the animals, but we're not treating ourselves. And that's probably why we are having the flarial worm issues. That is so interesting. Clee, make sure to reach out to me. Absolutely, because that's what I help people do. I help them to access practitioners, to access the treatments, to know how to take it safely. Because even, even if your doctor is willing to help you, he, he or she has probably never treated flarial worms. They don't have good tests. They are not comfortable with the parasite drugs because they've never used them. And I know in certain Canadas, like where I live in Canada, it is certain countries like Canada, it's it's almost illegal to treat parasites. They can only treat parasites if they have a positive stool test. And the stool tests are very, very inaccurate. So 99.9% .9 of the time, these are not showing up on this test. And people, the doctors are saying, well, you don't have parasites. And yes, we do have parasites. So it's really frustrating. So I teach people how to play that active role, to get the help they need, to make sure that, you know, that the doctor to, to give them the information so that they will help you to treat at an effective level. But it is challenging, Clee, to treat parasites or filarial worms. They're very small. They get deep, deep into our tissue under biofilms and all the way into the central nervous system. So it does take a little bit of strategy to treat them. Yes, it is. Knowledge is definitely power and you have to take action. Wise words, Robin, awesome. I'm so sorry, Colleen, you were diagnosed at the age of 21. That is a long time. Tenille, how can I get rid, how can I get, uh, get rid of them? So you're dealing with spasms in your leg. What I would do if you want to know the steps that we take in the academy, because this is for all chronic disease, it's not just for MS, but number one, it's you have to stop feeding the problem. Worms bacteria and fungus love carbohydrates. So as you decrease the carbs following the live disease free eating plan, you'll notice that the worms will be less active, fungus and bacteria also bad will be less active, and you'll start to notice symptom improvements. Then we support the body in various ways through making sure that we're having daily bowel movements, making sure we're sleeping at night, making sure we decrease radiation, especially now we're dealing with the uh, I won't say what it is because I'll get censored, but high levels of wireless radiation, decreasing that, especially where we're sleeping. And then also to make sure that we uh, deal with mold in our home, maybe looking at our blood work and supporting areas like maybe it's low, low thyroid or low iron. So supporting the body in various ways and then getting that's getting ready to treat and then we're ready to treat and this requires we found that the herbs are not enough on their own but parasite drugs and also the herbs and an oxidizing agent all together is miraculous for people and i really love working with students that catch it early i mean i love working with all the students but i just know that it's so much easier to treat these worms the earlier that you deal with them, treat them as soon as possible. So again, if you've had disease for 30 years, it's more work, there's more damage. If you can catch it before you're diagnosed, maybe you have a, several symptoms of MS and you're wondering like, you know, I'm kind of scared. I, there's a possibility I have MS. It usually takes quite a while to get a proper diagnosis. And the diagnosis, just watch my videos. I've got a lot of on 
diagnoses so that you understand that they're really just looking to see if they can find certain lesions in a certain part of your central nervous system. And it's, it's not telling you what's the cause and there is no cure according to them. But if you treat the worms, we've had students in as little as three months become symptom free. They're still treating, but there's the inflammation has gone down so much that they feel symptom free. And it, for people that are not really infected severely, I should say they still are because they have a neurological disease, but not as much as someone who's had it for 20 or 30 years. But they find that, you know, they just can get back to their life very quickly. They'll keep treating for up to four to six cycles, but it's just amazing how no more fear of the future, getting on the, with their life. And then once you get well, you're going to deworm yourself at least once or twice a year. You're going to make sure you never end up in this position, just like we do with all of our animals. Absolutely. So Clee, if you like, watch my masterclass training, and it's called How to Recover from MS. And it's all the same. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with filarial worms and you don't have MS or you have another condition. We have students with all kinds of different situations but that's you need to treat them as soon as possible because they will move into your central nervous system if they haven't already there is no vector surveillance i'm not sure what you mean by that vector i'm not sure if you're talking about mosquito they definitely don't look at mosquitoes yes it is very powerful hi susie okay i think that is it i just see a lot of Wonderful, positive notes, not a lot of questions. Colleen, your neuro neurologist says you're going to get worse. You won't get worse if you treat these infections, but it does take multiple cycles. Absolutely. I'm so sorry that you have become financially devastated. So Clee, just listen, I've got a ton of videos and just start implementing. If you greatly reduce the carbs following the live disease free eating plan, that is your first step. You'll notice that you'll start to feel a lot better. And I've got videos on supporting the body and things. So just start, just start to do that. And then watch my uh, masterclass training also. All right, I'm going to leave it there. There's quite a few different comments coming in here. You're very, very welcome. Thank you guys for all your kind words giving you so much hope. That is awesome. That is why I do this. My two functional medicine doctors will not prescribe ivermectin or albendazole. That is the problem, Nancy, is that, and that's what I help people to do. Uh, and your answer, just taking albendazole and ivermectin isn't necessarily going to cure you. It really, we found that it really takes a holistic approach. You really have to get ready. You have to get in a position where you're starting to feel a lot better. And then just taking the albendazole and ivermectin isn't enough because it's not just, we're talking about the filarial worms today, but it's not just the filarial worms. The Lyme infections are a really big part of it. Fungus is a really big part of it. A lot of my students have things like flukes and they could easily have a tapeworm. We're going to talk about research that Dr. Alan McDonald has found the larva, the immature forms of tapeworm in the central nervous system of MS patients too. So just wanting your doctor to prescribe two drugs doesn't mean that that's really what you need or that you're ready, that you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck as far as improvements and recovery. Yes, she's in Texas, Michael. All right. So Tanil, you were diagnosed in 2007. This is your answer is treating these infections. Make sure that you start to learn about this. I've got tons and tons of videos on that you'll learn a lot. And when you're ready, then reach out, watch the masterclass training. You can book a time to chat with me and you can become a wellness champion whenever you're ready. If you're looking for support in treating these infections. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go. Oh, before I go, I wanted to well or to wish our American wellness champions and just our American friends a wonderful, wonderful, happy Thanksgiving. I know that this year has been incredibly challenging, but we have so much to be thankful for still. And you need to focus on that. Focus on what there is to be thankful for. We definitely have to fight for our freedoms. 
But I'm just sending you my love and hope you have a wonderful holiday with your loved ones. And we do have on our website, Live Disease Free, we're going to post it in this video, a link to some different holiday, holiday ideas, meal ideas, so that you can eat healthy and you can enjoy your Thanksgiving dinner. And you're not going to pay for it. You're not going to let those worms binge and make you feel absolutely horrible next week. So enjoy those recipes. They're delicious. And the key is to get the total grams of carbs down. So maybe watch my video again on in the playlist, the eating plan, the live disease for eating plan, start to implement that. And if you go through your Thanksgiving holiday and you really cut back on the sweets and the processed carbs, then you're not going to feel so lousy. You're going to start to make that change. And then you can make 2021 an amazing year for yourself, better than you've had in many, many years. You are so very welcome. So until we meet again next week, and we'll talk about the testing of these filarial worms, take care and bye-bye for now.